ourselves in a very delicate moment where the old hasn't quite gone yet but it's crumbling and the new hasn't quite arrived yet but you can sort of I can, I can sense it yeah. I can't see it yet yeah. um, in other words I think that mainstream thinking is slowly waking up to the idea that the social model based purely on consumption and growth is driving our planet into ruin and that firmly held models on politics and economics and society are turning out to be obsolete. And I've observed over the last, over this past year, um, that decision makers are asking one specific question behind closed doors, and that is, why are we so stuck? Um, why is awareness and rational understanding not leading to changes in behavior that could prevent looming catastrophes. Yeah, because you will see that thinking has little to do with thinking. Thinking has lots to do with tradition, with uh, things that we consider to be normal. Why do we sell trees and not air? Because that's the way, uh, that's the way we got used to it. Um, mm, I think the situation that you describe, I actually quite agree with, with your description of this sort of sensing the new but not quite sure so what it is. We're in the tunnel now. I think the situation <laughs> like is peeking in. Yeah. The light is peeking in, but it's not quite. Yeah, the situation I think is similar to sort of medieval times when nobody believed in Catholic doctrine anymore, but we don't have Luther, mm. so to speak, or we don't actually have yet. Um, anybody who would say, okay, nobody wants to believe this anymore, we don't need an intermediate between God and human beings and all that nonsense that we believed once, um, this is a new thing for you to believe. So we are in the, in the situation of somewhat of a, of a, of a, of a you know, um, sort of, we no longer, even the credit crunch, credit means in Latin, faith. Um, uh, the official title, Credit Crunch, if you do a little bit of translating, it's called Faith Crunch. In other words, our belief in, the super, in, in this God of the markets who leads us forward, the unorchestrated orchestrator, you can't give your values to him, he will give your values to you, just like the church in the medieval times. My point is fundamentally that this God of the markets is dead, or he never, never existed. Uh, but we don't have a new global religion. So to, so to say that, um, uh, of course, the, the religion that we have today, the econ ec economic religion, is on one hand less aggressive and less dangerous than, let's say, the religious religions that we have. And we mustn't forget that art was also used very often and as a surface of, of showing the national pride so that you can hate the barbarians better because they have what? No culture. Um, but what you see today is that um, uh, the economic religion uh, is, can be also quite destructive. It, it, it didn't have its aim, eliminating people in the wars back. We never cared about civilian casualties. We just wanted to destroy that nation or that tribe. Today, we are becoming more empathic. Uh, and we have this economic religion. And uh, it's better than what it was before by far, but it is definitely not human yet enough. And I think here is actually is, is the work of, of, of any priests, be it artists or anybody who can see or sense 
the future a little bit to help in this birth of something that we would be able to live under and not being ashamed of. I think, you know, the ideas are already there. You know, I mean, we have the ideas, scientists have the ideas and solutions. I mean, we, but they just they haven't really been implemented yet. It's what we're waiting for now is really for the wave to kick in, like yeah. the sustainability revolution to really kick in because we have actually a lot of solutions to the problems. Just yeah, a lot of times it's the economic system that's, that stops yeah. or holds us back because yeah. it would mean, you know, a lot of change yeah. to businesses. And for this, I think I mean, you, need an, you need an economist. I mean, for somebody who, to again go back to the old medieval uh, Middle Ages, so to speak, or the ending of Middle Ages, um, only a man in a black gown can tear down the truth of a man in a black gown. So Luther had to be a theologian. It wouldn't actually be useful if, if, if somebody, you know, a doctor maybe. So if, 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 if you want to uh, change the belief of doctors, you also have to wear white gown so that you'd be respected. So I think it, it is time for an economist, an enlightened economist of course, who would, could come up with a, with a more, more believable system, a system with which we could identify more as human beings rather than machines or, or, or systematics and, um, and then show, show a, a road forward because I mean if, if we have all this wealth for and we are extremely wealthy here in Europe, we're not growing much but we are wealthy, uh, we're not becoming richer but we already are rich, this is something that should never be forgotten, this is what we should use the riches for, no? to help somebody who, who, who needs our help and to be able to become, become what we always wanted to. Mm. And I think, you know, going back to that, to that phrase, why are, we so being, being, why are we so stuck, that I heard from decision makers being asked, um, that same uh, phrase was used by Malign in a very different context. He was speaking about his work um, close to walls and in war zones, creating music, and he said, you know, when things get stuck, art can create openness. Yeah. And um, so really, you know, the question that we really should be asking and debating right now would then be, you know, how can art and culture create openness and change old mindsets and behavior patterns and, you know, perhaps how can economists help, help, us, help us with that? So, so this, is a, this reminds me <laughs> of a beautiful song by, <clears throat> by you too. You got stuck in a moment and you can't get out of it. Yeah. So this is something, um, this is where art and philosophy comes to say, okay, this is our situation. We got stuck, or this is the way we see it. We got stuck in a moment and we can't get out of it. Is this something that the rest of you feels? Or show me where, where we've done progress. And let's, um, let's, let's be here a little bit more, I would even say rigorous. I mean, we've been doing this. Uh, has the growth of capitalism, we've been, we've been doing this, has it really long-term helped decrease unemployment? Huh? Has it really um, uh, helped elevate world hunger? Yes, to a large degree. Has it really done this and done that, what we've expected? And really go rigorous history. Yes, these things capitalism has brought us. We now can, can have shoes. Everybody can have shoes. This is absolutely normal. Now, is that thanks to technology or is that thanks to economics? And what are the other things that we expected? Did we expect more equality from economics? Yes. Did that bring it about? No. Uh, so let's, let's focus on, on, on these areas. And perhaps all, even also say that, you know, I think this should be viewed positively. I think capitalism has brought us quite far. And uh, thank you. But we want to work further. So if you go to your grandmothers, you can take part of your way, you can take a train, but there's only as long as the train will take you. Now, there's nothing wrong with the train, but the train will not take you all the way. Then you need to go on a bike, and then you need to walk the stairs. And that's something that, again, reminds me of the New Testament, where, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the representatives of the old system, so maybe we can use that analogy a little bit as well. And he says, well, we need to put new wine into new... Uh, Baskets, because if you put new wine into old baskets, they will be, they will be teared to pieces, and that I think is the situation. We have new wine; we no longer want to do these exploitations as we have. So let's find a new, new containers for where uh, we as mankind are moving. 
No, but I think that that is already, again, a path forward, like the, the vision you presented about, you know, an enlightened economist having, yeah. and it's your job to challenge yes. the status quo and this crumbling old system. And then in a way, maybe for us as enlightened artists, you know, maybe this is our job right now to, to create openness where things get stuck and to change old mindsets and to change old behavior patterns. Um, because that's the times we're in and that's, that's what's necessary. Yeah, to pose mm -hmm. questions yes. and to, to sort to, of to question... To our craft to, to really, you know, um, go where, where, where things are stuck and try to, yeah. to, to open them up. That's something we can do. But that, yeah. of course, is also the idea of an enlightened artist because that is very far away from, you know, la pour la. Yeah. No, you talk about enlightenment a lot. Yeah. Well, it's somehow becoming... It's a nice image because, um, because I think, again, putting, putting uh, it into a brief sentence, I think the, the program of enlightenment was twofold. In the first step, we discovered during the time of enlightenment that there is so much knowledge on earth that it will never fit one human brain, not even that of Einstein. So what we've decided is, okay, you do art, specifically dancing, specifically contemporary dancing, specifically small little fraction of art. You go and study nails and you go into medicine and you go into food hygiene and you go into economics. We all specialize, we all run into whatever interests us and find out things. That was the step number one. There we did reasonably well. The problem there, that there was a second step, which was, and then we all come together and we put the picture together. Now, I think step number two could be as difficult and could take quite a long time, because this was hundreds of years before we actually yeah. got to the point where it's like, okay, I am too deep in it, as interesting as it is, I no longer see the connection to the rest of the world. So sometimes I even make fun of my friends economists. I suggest that economy should be taught at universities as a subset of sociology, just for us to understand that this what we're doing is not to be done at the expense of society. And you will find this, um, and, and this is one of the wonderful contributions of an Austrian dancer economist, um, uh, Mr. Felber, who actually discovered that if there is a constitution in the country, it usually says that the economy is there to be to serve the common good. So we already have it in our constitution that the role of the economy is not to serve personal interest, but to serve public good. And also that means that public good is not to serve the economy, but vice versa. Um, yeah, so, so these are all the things we, and this is, I think, my role and perhaps also your role to say, okay, um, come out of the hole, stop being Fachidioten. Exactly. And try to, and we all know, we all know that psychology is connected with economics, with politics, and politics is connected with history, and history is connected with geopolitics, and geopolitics is connected with culture, and culture is connected. We all know that everything is connected but we are unable to make these connections and there I see that philosophy, um, uh, I think, uh, should also come out of its analytical deep hole and stop pretending that analytical philosophy is, is all of the philosophy that there is. Uh, and this is also the role for, for, for art. You should have people who are digging down in the most deepest mud but you, your field should also have people who can communicate what you found with other people. Exactly. I think, I think really that's how I started uh, really thinking a lot about, about that whole enlightenment idea because, um, you know, Wilson just, just also started thinking about this last year. He wrote a book and he said, you know, the first step of the enlightenment was to get a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge. And we've done that. We've done that. Yeah. We're all specialized yeah. now. Now is the moment for the second enlightenment where we need to find our ways together. Oh, so I'm not so original with this thought. Well, this is always you a problem. Didn't read my I, no, no, <laughs> I, I know. This so is really, and I mean, I was sitting here at Yasa, you hmm. know, and, and I, I had to write. Um, and Wilson, uh, this is wonderful. It was Wilson, thinking. and it's, uh, uh, the book is uh, the, the Meaning of Human Existence. It just yeah. came out last year. Yeah. And I was sitting here, and I was supposed to write uh, on the, what I'm going to do as an artist within Yasa. And then, of course, Wilson came to my mind. and. Uh, then I realized, okay, this is the moment nice. for the second enlightenment yeah. because we are specialized enough and our problems are big enough that 
us coming together is also now needed. You know, so maybe also for that now is the moment that we can have a second enlightenment, not because it's fun, but or because it's interesting, but we need it to solve global challenges. We we don't have a choice but to work together now. But I think it's a good thing. You know, it's again this crisis. I mean, chance within the crisis. Yeah. So I think this is our moment. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Really, this is this is this is just a, a logical, and we shouldn't be mad at people who who are trying to connect. Um, connect the dots and, 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 and put it together and uh, reach out to, to other fields of interest because, because if we fail to do this, politicians will have to do it. And this is really, this is really I mean, uh, and of course there's many things you can criticize politics, but politicians will try to do the best they can in, let's say, the good, good scenario. And if the nation, if, if it's people who have studied this, people who have feelings about it. If they're silent, then the politicians will have to decide in vacuum and perhaps they could even decide in a way that nobody actually wants. Uh, but they will find the least common denominator, which is of course they will resort to this because that's the only thing that they can do if there is no, no higher ideas in the society except for the least common denominator, which I would say economics has become the least common denominator exactly because we can calculate it. <laughs> but just because we can calculate it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's the most valuable uh, elephant in the room. So we know that the problems we face today, like rising, raising inequality and refugees and global change, you know, can not be solved using the traditional methods based on short-sighted economic growth. Um, and to make that point more understandable to mainstream thinking and also more inclusive, perhaps more inclusive for developing countries because I mean, it's understandable that they still want to grow for a while. Um, some scientists have sh shifted from speaking about the limits of growth to growth within limits. So do you think that's a sensible? Yeah, it's still growth. So if I want to be absolutely, you know, rigorous and slightly more philosophical, as I always, oh, why, do, why does it? Why me, what's wrong with, you know, being stationary? But I mean, uh, well, what would you, you know, would you be, since you're a, a prominent challenger of growth? Would you phrase it that way? Would you say, you know, growth within limits, just to make sure that, you know, even people who didn't believe in this first are coming on board and also that, you know, developing countries don't feel um, excluded because, of course, they still want to grow. But no, no, no. if you All have China, I'm, you yeah, understand. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. they get it. They, they know we need limits, with, I mean, yeah. growth within limits, but they still want to grow. For that, for that fine. I mean, for, for <laughs> developing economies, yes. But what I'm saying is to our Western developed, yeah. so if we call ourselves developed, yeah. then, then you know, growth is, should really be for countries that are developing. Yeah. Like a child, you, know, you expect the child to develop, to grow. Yeah. There comes a point where the child becomes an adult. If you, if you really still are focused on that child's growing, you will feed him till he or she will grow, but not vertically, but, but horizontally. So, yeah, um, uh, it's... So you, it's, you're it's, okay with that? I mean, you, you, you agree for, for, with that? For developing countries, yes, of course, they must uh, make sure that they don't... I mean, and this happened in China you know, a couple of months ago, that they, they suffer from same um, manic collapses, not depression collapses, but manic collapses. But to me, sooner or later, the, and this is something that it's not my invention, but all the classical economists were talking about. They called it the stationary state. They said growth, interestingly enough, today, somebody, people who talk about limits to growth or not growing too much, they're very often deemed leftish, while people who believe in growth are deemed right wing. This is actually, a, 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 if you read the classics, it's the other way around. Growth is for poor people, for developing yeah. countries. The, in the theory of a leisure class by Thorsten Veblen, who's an economist sociologist, um, there the message is clear. Rich people do leisure. The sign of a rich person, a developed person, is leisure. It's exactly the defining characteristic of, 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 um, of, uh, of, of somebody who's actually already affluent. So to me, the idea that rich should sort of come to the to, 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 to realization that yeah this is this is this spending more energy trying to grow this way is not really going to bring me anywhere much further. 
That to me is a fundamentally sort of a right wing uh, idea. And uh, trying to grow, 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 grow all the time is a left. I mean, a leftish idea during the communist regime, the, 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 which I unfortunately uh, was in sort of experience. experience in my country. There, they were over obsessed with all these five year plans and catching up with the West and overtaking the West and growing this and growing that, even more rigorous than what you find today. And it was destroying the environment much more fervently than the, than the competing capitalist system. So uh, this sort of belief that we must grow uh, at all times at the expense of, of, um, of, of, of the environment is a, a, a left-wing idea as much as it is right-wing, and I would even claim that it's rather, rather, rather that. So this exploitation of human beings has nothing to do with the right-wing. It, it's, it's actually something that was very strong with, com with communism as well. And interestingly enough, last point, when communism started failing, it didn't produce the GDP growth, the first immediate question was, oh, we were not believing in communism enough. <laughs> so, you know, and you fear this, you, you hear, sort of hear this yeah. again. You know, it's, 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 we haven't been capitalist enough. We haven't been ecumenic enough. That's why the economy doesn't believe, yeah. uh, doesn't grow. Yeah. So maybe to finish up, I'll, I'll, I'll share my, my favorite recommendation from the, the Growth Within Limits scientists. So, so they are saying, for example, um, you know, um, investment in education and innovation and research um, should be there to develop uh, new progressive ideas to